Did Joseph Smith really practice polygamy as early as 1831? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex Morning Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you joining us. If you were with us last time, we got we were introduced to Danny Larson, and he's here again, or continues to be here. Continue to be here, <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a delight, and and we share such a common background in this journey that we've both been on. It's just uh, really terrific, and praise be to our dear Lord and Savior, yes, right? Yes, yes. Jesus you. is everything to us. Well, one of the things, as I mentioned before, is Danny's involved in what's called TalkingToMormons.com. And Danny, why don't you explain how that came about? And we're going to show you a little clip of it as well. Okay, I'll just give you a brief background yeah. on it. Uh, several years ago, when I stepped away from, the, from religion to go to my home and just isolate myself there for a, f a few months while I was studying to try to resolve, remember all those things I was trying to to, to, uh, to take a look at the questions and doubts that I had on my shelf. I decided I needed to do that in order to move forward. Uh, I just Were had you to trying know. to prove the church true. I did. Originally? I wanted to know the church That's is true. That's what I was doing yeah. at first. I thought I better take my Bible, I better open my Bible and start to read it for really for the first time with open eyes and heart. And as I began reading John 1 1, <laughs> and then John, the whole chapter, the first chapter of John, I, tears were flowing down my, my face, and I just. I was convicted. I just thought this is not the Jesus that I've ever known. He was a Jesus that I knew in eight, at, when I was 18, when I had that spiritual experience. But I've craved to have that relationship with him, and now I know who he is. Yeah. And so um, it was not long after that, though, that I had a couple missionaries, LDS missionaries, come to my door. It was in February. It was snowing outside. It was cold, and they, I let them in. And uh, <laughs> as they were trying to encourage me to come back to, to activity in the church, my first inclination as my flesh rose up was to, you know, tell them where it's like it is, you know, <laughs> and to correct their tell understanding. Them, of, tell them what they don't know. <laughs> exactly. And at that moment, God just spoke to my heart and said, Danny, just, just get out of the way. Let me do this. And my, I just completely calmed down. And then I did the best thing I think I, I, I did, I could have done at the moment. I asked them to bear their testimonies to me. Wow. I said, tell me your testimony about who God is. And so they were excited to do that. And then I said, can I share a testimony with you? Yes, we would love to hear your testimony, Brother Larson. And so I said, it's not really my testimony, though. It's God's testimony about himself. And they had their Bibles right there, scriptures in their laps. So I said, open up to Isaiah. So I took them to those scriptures in the previous oh. uh, show that we had. Yeah. I talked about Isaiah 43.10 and yeah. Isaiah 44, 6 and 8. I had them take turns reading those scriptures. And at the end... They got up and they, actually the senior companion walked out of my house without even saying goodbye, came back. The two of them came back five days later unannounced and said they apologized for walking out abruptly. And that he said, I had never considered God being the only one true living God. And everything that God said about himself, I couldn't reconcile with my Mormon belief. So he said, we've been home in our apartment for five days praying and reading the Bible. We've come back and we've asked you to teach us everything that you know. It was the greatest experience, I think, spiritual experience I've ever had in my life. And oh my I just goodness. was... It, this, and we how long had this been for you? To, uh, how long had you been out, so to speak? Well, I'd been probably nine months. months just not going to church and yeah. studying and reading. Yeah, And I had this wonderful experience with what them. A so, yeah, so we, at the end, I'll make this real short, at the end we stood and had prayer in the middle of my front room, we held hands. I prayed over them and asked them, God to bless them, that as they went around teaching to the people here in Utah, that they would share Jesus Christ and, and His Word. And uh, it was wonderful. Wow. It was great. But from that was a genesis of an idea that I had when it came to, what if, maybe what if I took different topics in Mormonism, and Christianity, and I created a video using, using animated characters to, um, to go through one of these conversations with missionaries to show that it can be done in a very friendly, likable, uh, loving way. And so just we, kind of a question answer yeah, uh, yeah. discussion. Yeah, using scriptures to clarify everything. So oh. we, have this, we have this clip that uh, we'll show her to the audience. Elders, have you ever prayed to know if the Book of Abraham is true? No. So the promise in the Book of Mormon to pray and ask God if it is true doesn't apply to the Book of Abraham? Not necessarily. 
How can you trust that the book of Abraham is the word of God? We have to have faith that Joseph Smith is a prophet and that he had the gift to translate. From ancient Egyptian into 16th century King James English, no less. Are you aware that what Joseph Smith claimed to be a correct translation of the book of Abraham has since been proven to be a fraud? Why do you say that? Let me be... So that's a sample of uh, one of the episodes that we did and yeah. uh, I've uh, already <clears throat> I've already released about 85 of them and so they're I on the internet that. they're on YouTube and they're and relatively short yes I mean, only just... three to six minutes long that's yeah. it I, I, I'm really concise I want to make sure that I uh, um, provide all the verses and actually a script uh, is provided a narrative of that is, is provided on the website after each one of those so if anybody wants to use it uh, yeah. But that's all also under our uh, website at TalkingToMormons.com. And if they want to get in touch with you, I think we've been putting your phone number up, so yeah. hopefully they contact mm -hmm. you if you have any questions or yeah. want to support what you do. I'm sure that great. would be appreciated. Thank you. Well, one of the things that, uh, thank you, Danny, that's really terrific. And I've watched a bunch of them, and they're just, they're really well done. And Thanks. And you've actually keep making little adjustments to them. Yeah. Seth, Motor is, Seth Motor is a tech, technical, my friend that has, has a technical mind and he does all the he graphics does. and all that. So I he's, can do without him. He's so super. <laughs> well, one of the things you mentioned, John 1.1, 1, 1, and I don't think we've included that today, but that one really impacted me too. But the scriptures themselves, the Bible, Carla and I sat there at the Bible. We started with John and we started crying. I'd read the New Testament a number of times and marked it up. And I went back actually to my missionary Bible and I looked at the scriptures that I did underline <laughs> and they weren't the ones that I would under, underline today. Uh, but anyway, we've, we've got, I think about six scriptures that really were meaningful to, to us. And, and as you <clears throat> think about these, uh, think about what they actually say. And the first one I have is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you're saved. Now again, that term, is it just resurrected or are we actually saved? Saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's what we did in Mormonism. We were proud of our accomplishments. Yeah. Which one of you got Oh, that? you know, I, I try to find some verses that weren't um, real common, but, but something that meant something to me personally, yeah. and that was uh, when, when in John 9, chapter 9, I remember reading this in my Bible and and uh, being very touched by the, the the healing of the blind man by Christ, and the blind man didn't even know who had actually healed him, and he was, then the blind man, after it became public, was called to the San, into the Sanhedrin, yeah. and those men, the governing of uh, of the Jews, <laughs> wanted to know who who, did, who did this, and he said, "I don't know." I says, "All I know is that one thing I was one." One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. And I, I thought I can really relate to that. My eyes had been opened up when the blinders yeah. fell off from my eyes. And uh, so I was, I was uh, grateful for that. Right there in John 9. Yeah. Well, my next one is John 4, 22 and 5. For if Abraham were justified by works, seems like I have a theme here. <laughs> if, for if Abraham was justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. But not before God, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Not about our righteousness, no. it's about Christ. It's all about him. Jesus' righteousness. The author and finisher of our faith. Yeah. And then another one that I loved was, um, you know, being in Mormonism for 60 years and giving my all to it. And thinking, why did I spend so much time, you know, there when I could have been doing something. I, re I decided that it wasn't going to be the end of, you know, I needed to pour myself into something to glorify his name. And so I recalled the statement that Isaiah made in Isaiah uh, 6, 8, where he says to, to God, who was looking for someone to go out and to preach and to teach. And he said, here am I, send me. And I Just thought that simple. That, that is a great you know, theme for my life and what I want to do. And that's why I'm on Talking to Mormons and doing other things with my podcast, just to glorify his name. To turn your life to God and let him do what he wants to with that's you. That's right. Yeah. And, Take, uh, and let him have all the that's credit. That's powerful. Sure. That's powerful. Well, this one meant a lot to me. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. 
God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And it just struck me how, <laughs> what the restoration really meant, the apostasy that never happened, and right. where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I also. And uh, it just struck me that uh, it's all about Jesus it and is. not about the, the early prophets. And no. So that was my... Okay, the last one that I have here is in First John chapter 3, verse 23. We know that God, or Christ, when He came, He came to fulfill the law, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so that the commandment that He asks us to, to, to fulfill on our part is to love others. That's all He asks of. That's yeah. the royal law. J James yeah. says yeah. It calls it the royal law. The great commandment. But this verse in, in John, 1 John chapter 3, verse 23 says, And this is His commandment, that we should believe on, his na on the name of the Son, that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. It's just that simple. Again, love. Love. And believe. Faith. Thanks, Danny. Those are great. And even the whole Bible now is just yeah. Hebrews oh, yeah. from John. It's kind of like picking the, which, which children, which of your children is your favorite? Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> but they impacted us, and, and hopefully they might impact someone else as they think about... Uh, about things. Anyway, my, my next topic is the book of Abraham, and that was interesting that John, uh, Jim had picked that little clip about that. I won't go into the whole detail, but there were obviously uh, uh, some, some mummies that were for sale back in 1835 or something, mm -hmm. in 33, and 35. Joseph Smith, 35. Joseph Smith purchased them on behalf of the church, I think for about $2,400 or so, and uh, again, uh, he began, and it says this uh, in the History of the Church, Volume 2, page 238. The remainder of this month, I, Joseph Smith, was continually engaged, continually engaged in translating an alphabet to the Book of Abraham and arranging a grammar of the Egyptian language as practiced by the ancients. Well, the, presumably the papyrus was burned up in the 1871 fire in Chicago, but lo and behold, in, 18, in 1967, somebody in the M Metropolitan Museum of Art, I believe, mm -hmm. finds this, uh, uh, some papyrus, including the facsimiles, and brings them to the church. They acquire them. I was actually on my mission then, and I didn't realize that they made a big splash in the ensign and all that. And then all of a sudden, and here I am, a very active member of the church after I get home from in 1968, I never hear about it. You know, you'd think, boy, this is going to prove Joseph Smith was a prophet. But I do have this quote from the Daily Universe, uh, BYU's paper. Hugh Nibley said, The papyrus scripts given to the church do not prove the book of Abraham is true. LDS scholars are caught flat-footed by this discovery. So, you know, it's just funny how uh, Egyptologists and others that have looked at these papyrus and the facsimiles and Joseph Smith's explanations and grammar just don't have anything to do with, uh, with Abraham or... Uh, I think it's been... You know, that doctrine that, that he came out of it. I think that more people have left the church in recent years over discovering that part of the, this that the book of abraham was not a direct translation from the papyri yeah yeah pretty shocking now one thing that we i <clears throat> thought maybe we might even mention the beginning we haven't there is something out there called the gospel essays the church yes, did I'll, 13 I'll be talking about do you those. will be talking about mm -hmm. okay yeah. well i reread the book of abraham one uh today actually and um I was just amazed at what they're not saying and what they do say and, and how... They're still not fully disclosing no. the truth. They're not really being that honest about it. Okay, so the, next, topic. the next topic is Jesus as Jehovah. We know that in Mormonism, Jesus is a spirit brother from the pre-existence yeah. who is a literal offspring of heavenly parents, right. as well as we were. And yeah. Satan. And Satan. And so... <laughs> We are all brothers, right? Right. And related to each other in that fashion, according to Mormonism. But um, it's beautiful as a Christian to know that um, he has always been God and that um, right. as the Word of God, he came to earth to gain a body of flesh and bone and became our Savior and was willing to die for us right. as a God incarnate and uh, that he is who we worship. And as Christians, we can pray to Christ 
and uh, not whereas in Mormonism that was nothing that we, we never did that we no. always only pray to Jesus or Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father in the name of Christ right. so it's it's great to be able to honor him in his proper you know yeah. position of honor yeah one thing that struck me about that top particular topic was how did Jesus get to become Jehovah or yeah. God yeah. of the Old Testament because he hadn't been to an earth to get a body hadn't been married in the temple uh, hadn't been baptized and so on and so on. So how did he get to be God? Uh, before he came, before he came he to earth, came to yeah. earth to get same a body. thing with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. He's still waiting to get a body. So how did he get to Godhood? First? <laughs> yeah. All right. The next one I have is the different versions of the first vision. And gosh, you know, we could spend two yeah. or three sessions on just that. But it did turn out that Joseph Smith wrote at least four, or was it responsible for four different versions? And then there were another several, three or four or five, that were written by very close friends or scribes. But the one that really struck me that Grant Palmer mentioned in his book, uh, uh, Insider's View of Mormon Origins, and I give him credit for that, but one of the things he, uh, when I started reading the fact that Joseph Smith in 1832 had written his own account in his own handwriting, and he wasn't asking about which church was true. He was only asking about whether his sins could be forgiven. And that struck me. And then he only saw one person in that particular yeah. one. And all these different versions are different. They're not the same and different than the one that's in the Pearl of Great Price. And again, that started making me question this 1820 experience. Well, yeah. is, did it really happen the way the way he said it did. Did that strike you too? Think about I think about all the missionaries that went out on their mission during those early days who never even knew about a first vision. Yeah. They never talked about it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, because it hadn't been you know, it hadn't been it actually wasn't canonized something discussed. until many years later. Right. And so it wasn't And you would of think scripture. that the people would have talked about that oh, yeah. con continually that sure. from, at least from the time the church was organized in eighteen thirty. Yeah. After that, they would have talked about this first vision and so on. Okay. Okay, the next topic are is Mormon doctrines not in the Book of Mormon? <laughs> <laughs> There's a long list of those, isn't there? Yeah. Um, I want to read a quote by Joseph Smith. He's from History of the Church, Volume 4, page 461. He says, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct book of any book, uh, most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And a man could get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. <laughs> so, well, what precepts make it so correct? Um, we, As you read the Book of Mormon, you, you, you begin to realize that in 1830, when Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon, he was reading it from his Protestant viewpoint. And so yeah. he was still thinking as a Protestant that God, that there was only... Uh, one God. I, I believe that. Yeah, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's, one, that's taught in the Book one of God. That's taught yeah. in the Book of Mormon. The Trinity. That's right. Um, and then it, it also teaches that um, God was never the offspring of ma of man. It doesn't teach that uh, marriage is required for a celestial glory. It doesn't teach. Well, it doesn't it, it talk taught, at all about celestial kingdom or at all. Does no, it, it doesn't talk about any of the three kingdoms of glory. Right. right. It uh, teaches generally that polygamy was wrong. Right. Um, you know, but yet they, they live polygamy today spiritually. We know that. Oh, yeah. President Oaks and uh, President Nelson, Nelson are both sealed to wives, two wives. And they each. expect to have them in heaven. Yeah, they do. Uh -huh. yeah. um, it, it teaches that it's impossible to do vicarious work for people because in Alma it says that you're, you can't procrastinate. There's only one opportunity to accept the gospel. So yeah, today, why are they doing all that work for the dead if those people aren't accepting the gospel or having a chance to accept it up there? Yeah, now is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Yeah, <laughs> It doesn't teach about temple ordinances, covenants, endowments, sealings, baptisms for the dead, washings and, and anointings, special handshakes and tokens, or new names. Yeah. However, there are some interesting verses, and I'll let the audience look these up in the Book of Mormon if they have one. Helaman chapter 6, verse 22 mentions people, the Book of Mormon people, having secret signs and secret words. Mm -hmm. And then in 2 Nephi chapter 26, verse 22, it, men it mentions secret combinations and combinations of the devil. All of these are attributed to Satan in the Book of Mormon. So and they're yet, all negative. They're all negative, yet these secret things 
they call sacred show up in Mormon temples. Yes, they do. So it doesn't teach about a health code like uh, the Word of Wisdom or the pre-existence, pre-mortal life. Um, and uh, it, uh, like the Bible, the Book of Mormon teaches that God is a spirit. It doesn't teach that he had a body as flesh and bone. No. That doesn't happen until we... The revelation in uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 130 was given, verse 22, that God has a body of flesh and bones. It doesn't talk about priesthood authority and doesn't talk about the three degrees of glory like we said. Yeah. And uh, that's it. Yeah, huh? we ran through those. I'm okay, sorry. yeah. There's so many. <laughs> you know what? Okay. So the next one I have is the Aaronic priesthood, and, and it, it kind of ties in with this first vision situation where we weren't hearing anything about it. I'm just going to ha uh, quote this from Apostle William E. McClellan. He said this, I joined the church in 1831. For years I never heard of John the Baptist ordaining Joseph and Oliver. I, I heard not of, Peter, of James, Peter, and John doing so. In 1870 he said, I heard Joseph Smith tell his experience of the ordination by Cowdery and the organization of the church probably more than 20 times to persons who, near the rise of the church, wish to know and hear about it. I never heard of Moroni, John, Peter, James, the other John, John the Baptist, I guess. But as to the story of John the Baptist ordaining Joseph and Oliver on the day that they were baptized, I never heard of it in the church for years, although I carefully noticed things that were said. Isn't that crazy? Again, yeah, that was Grant Palmer's book yeah. that had that quote in it. But um, I just think it's amazing that the, the church relies so much on this priesthood. And w one of the recent Ensign articles, uh, I think by a Hank Smith, BYU professor, said that, uh, he, he said this, around six months before the Savior died, just following the bestowal of priesthood keys on Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, well, I went back and I read all the different accounts of the Mount of Transfiguration. There's no talk of Melchizedek yeah. priesthood, no keys, nothing. We just, but a Mormon will read that and just yep. slurp it up, <laughs> even right. though they don't know at all what's in it. No. Go ahead. Okay. The next topic is the Book of Commandments, and I think I'll just briefly oh, go through this. This is so fun. <laughs> the Book of Commandments was a, uh, a compilation of all the revelations Joseph Smith received from 1833 to 1835. Yeah. Uh, when they decided to reprint it, they called it the Doctrine and Covenants, and from 1835 to the present day, that's what we have are those revelations. Right. But significant changes had taken place during that time. and. Uh, it's interesting that God will say something in one time, and then when it's reprinted, you'll find all kinds of <laughs> words, significant changes yeah. made to the context, uh, added or subtracted. And right. I just, who had the uh, authority to do that? Was it God or was it man that was manipulating yeah. that? Who got it wrong? The who first got it time? wrong the first time? Yeah. So I'm not going to use these examples that I was going to show just for the sake of time. But I also, but I do want to say that in section there was section 101 in the Doctrine and Covenants in the uh, all the editions up to 1867 that it says in verse four quote inasmuch as this Church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman but one husband. And yet, all during this time, for 20 years leading up to this revelation, they had been practicing polygamy. So they were really lying when they said that. Now that section has been replaced with section 132, which teaches that plural marriage is a celestial law. Right. Of course, that was Joseph Smith trying to justify his taking his wife secretly behind Emma's back. That's right. So. Well, interestingly enough, my next topic is polygamy and polyandry, yeah. and I was using that same quote oh. from section 101, okay. which is just fine. Just we don't that. need to repeat it. But I was so amazed, I had never, ever heard of that before. Had you ever? Uh, no, I hadn't. You're a seminary teacher. I know. And I've been active. I've read, not hundreds, but dozens of LDS books. Plan of, uh, the Doctrines of Salvation, Answers to Gospel, yeah. Quest, all those I've read. Never heard that the Section 101 was in there. And can you imagine missionaries going to England and all over the world preaching? No, we don't practice polygamy. Look at Section 101. No, we believe yeah. one and one. 
Then they get over here and find out that they're practicing Blind for the Lord. But I do want to read this, and this is what I started out with. This is in the introduction. No, this is in the introduction to section 132. And you can read this right now in your Doctrine and Covenants. Although the Revelation, section 132, was recorded in 1843, it is evident from the historical records that the doctrines and principles involved in this revelation had been known by the prophets since 1831. Don't you love the way they say yeah. it? <laughs> that the principles of this revelation had been known by the prophets since 1831. And then lastly, then this is just a shock that I know I'd read it, but I never paid attention. DNC section 132.54, I command my handmaid, Emma Smith, to abide and cleave unto my servant Joseph and to none else. And if she will not abide this commandment of plural marriage, she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord, for I am the Lord thy God and will destroy her if she abide not in my law. Wow. That There's, sounds like a loving God, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, loving husband too. Yeah, loving husband. Okay, next one. Okay, we're going to have to briefly go through this, but this is uh, involving or regarding the cross, Gethsemane and the atonement. Oh boy, that's okay. a big one. Yeah. President Nelson recently said, In the Garden of Gethsemane, our Savior took upon himself every pain, every sin, and all of the anguish and suffering ever experienced by me and everyone who has ever lived or will, will ever live. Under the weight of that excruciating burden, he bled from every pore. So, him talking about the atonement taking place in the Garden of Gethsemane um, really takes people's eyes off the cross. It really does. And I think that's really detrimental to yeah. the salvation of people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here's supposed to be a prophet of God talking like that. A misunderstanding scripture. In fact, there's no Mormon scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants or, or uh, Pearl of Great Price or Book of Mormon that says that it occurred in the garden. It talks so about the pain and the suffering, but it doesn't say it was in the garden. But these modern day prophets have interpreted it to be in the garden instead of on the cross. Who really became, came along and really made that? The more well, what, I think what thinking. they what they do is they look at Luke chapter 22 verse 44 where it says his sweat was as if were it drop. were drops of blood falling right. to the ground. Yeah, and, and that's where he shed his blood. Yeah, though. but it was just as if it was drops but of blood. It's but never it was, mentioned again in the New no. Testament. And Christ prayed to have the cup removed from him, remember, that oh, it I might know. pass by him. And uh, we know that God sent an angel to strengthen him just, in the garden just, so yeah. that he would be able to overcome the flesh, the weakness of the flesh, so that he could go to the cross. He knew what was impending, what was he, yeah. waiting for him there. And so we know that as he left the garden with uh, Peter, James, and John, that the temple guard came down to arrest I him. I love this. I love this. And Peter pulled out his sword and cut Malchus's ear off. Yeah. And this is, again, where you know, we know that it didn't happen in the garden because they hadn't drank the cup yet. He says in John 18, 11, Put up thy sword into the sheaf. This cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? And so he yeah. knew that he was going to be... He knew he hadn't done it yet. No. He was just getting strength, and I mean, it was important, but it was to get strength. As soon as he turned himself over to the guard, then into the hands of wicked men, that's when the brutal beatings and the torture, and then eventually the crucifixion took place. But um, no angel was sent to him to, to strengthen him at the cross. In fact, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, Mormons have an aversion to the cross. It used to be back in the early days, even when they were living here in, United, in, in Utah, that Mormon leaders and their wives and all the members would wear crosses. They did. Uh -huh. They did. You can see pictures of them. Go online and you can you can type in. Old you know, pictures. Uh -huh. huh? Oh yeah, a lot. Their stained glass in their in their chapels were with the cross. Their brand for their cattle that they the Mormon cattle was the cross. So it wasn't until 1850 or excuse me 1957 when David O. McKay decided to have a, to institute a no cross policy. Really? That, he didn't. He wanted reason? to separate. He wanted to separate Mormonism from Catholicism and Christianity. So he said, "We're no longer going to display the cross in our in our meeting houses, and we we discourage you from wearing the cross around your neck." And so um, it was that recent, though. Yeah. So uh, another one of my favorite scriptures is in First Corinthians chapter one, verse eighteen: "For oh. the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God." So the gospel is the good news, and therefore the symbol of the good news 
is not the angel Moroni, <laughs> it's the cross. Well, that's excellent. Now, one thing that struck me thinking about my garments one day as a Mormon is that the, they were all about me and what I had accomplished. Yeah. Now I wear a cross, and it's all about what Jesus did. Yeah, it's beautiful. Hey, Danny, we're out of time. We'll do one more, and hopefully, and maybe a couple more. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Ex-Mormon Files.